So today I will talk about uh, homologically variance of the ordering operation. Here is the base two reference that um, we will refer later, and I will give some motivation. Then we will introduce vertex and arrow removal, and then we'll discuss uh, some homological invariance. So so let's let's start with the motivation. So. Uh, one of the maybe most famous and the, as I'm writing long-standing open problems is what is the finite dimension conjecture. So lambda in this talk will be finite dimension algebra over a field, and later if I write just an, an algebra, it will be always a finite dimension algebra over a field. So the finite dimension is defined as the supremum of of the project dimension of all finite generated modules which have finite project dimension. Okay, and the finite dimension conjecture asserts, and this is due to bus, um, that uh, this uh, dimension is, is, is always finite. Okay, now um, this is a very interesting homological invariant. So, for example, just, just I mean, some examples for those that they have not seen this before. If, if you have an algebra of finite global dimension, then of course these two things coincide. Okay, so this. Really, it's, it's interesting and makes sense for algebra so if infinite global dimension. So, um, as I'm writing here, so it's, the finite dimension is known to be related with several other important problems in representation theory, and somehow the homological behavior and the structural theory of the model category they are somehow measured from the finite dimension. And here you can think a simple example. So, if you take kx modulo x square, this is an algebra of infinite global dimension but it has find this dimension lambda equals zero because it's self injective right and this and this number this zero number it's really it fits perfectly with how simple is the model category of kx x square right although that has infinite global dimension the find this dimension gives a much more accurate uh, measure of the complexity of, of the model category for the algebra and and also as, as i said it, it's it's really related with almost all the other homological conjectures that, that we know. Here is a diagram that you see here on the top is the finite dimension conjecture. And basically it implies uh, most of the other homological conjectures that, that we may see in representation theory. Okay, we will not discuss the Nakayama conjecture or anything else or the Gorenstein symmetry conjecture, but this is just to see that the finite dimension conjecture is somehow in this hierarchy uh, on, on the top of the list, okay? So, uh, so we would like to compute the finite dimension. Okay. So, what are the say the known reduction techniques in order to compute the finite dimension? So, the first, uh, the first, the first uh, known reduction technique is due to Fosum to Fosum Griffith-Reiter. So, when you have a triangular matrix ring, so R and S, uh, sorry, a triangular matrix algebra. So, R and S are algebras, and me is an RS by module, then Fosum with Ryden proved that the finite dimension of lambda is bounded by the finite dimension of R plus the finite dimension of S and one plus one. Okay. So if you really want to understand the finite dimension of this matrix ring, you really need to know the finite dimension of the, of the corner algebras. Okay. So th this is somehow considered to be one, one uh, maybe the first uh, reduction techniques. To compute the finite dimension. Okay. Now the second uh, technique uh, uses the elements of the derived model categories. So suppose that you have an algebra lambda that lives inside this diagram. So what is this? This is this is the bound derived category of finite lambda modules. Here is again the derived category of another algebra, and here is also the direct category of another algebra again, now is R. And this diagram means that we have these three functors here, these three, three functors here, triangulated functors. And you can just think somehow that, uh, that you have an, ad, an, ad, an adjoint triple on the right-hand side, and you just take the kernel and you can complete the diagram with the, with the adjoints. And in this case, this happened also from the left to right. So, but we'll see, in a bit the, the the actual definition, okay? But somehow you have an algebra that you know that lives in such a diagram, okay? Then Hubble showed 
that the finite dimension of lambda is finite if and only if the finite dimension of the outer terms is finite of R and S. Okay, so again, this is another reduction technique, but but of course, uh, it's not so easy if you, if you give me if you give me an algebra right to construct a collimate where both the outer terms are finite dimensional algebra. Okay, we know several techniques that we can build such a such a nice diagram, but sometimes the outer terms are not fundamental algebras. Okay, and something that I also want to mention is that a recent uh, say technique of Sang Sang C, where he has considered a um, pair of algebras where A is an extension of B, right? So um, just think that B is a subalgebra of A, and there's a nice property with respect to the radical of B, that he has to be a left ideal in A. And then, if the finite dimension of A is finite, then the finite dimension of B is finite. This is due to one in C. Okay. So another uh, reduction technique that is, goes back to Fuller and Saurin. So they, they introduced the idea of killing, of eliminating simples of project dimension uh, uh, less or equal to one. Okay. And what does this mean? So pick an idempotent f which corresponds to such a simple module and take the idempotent one minus f e and then they prove that if you know that the finite dimension of e lambda e is finite then you can show that the finite dimension of lambda is finite okay this is a very interesting technique that gave us a lot of motivation for what you will see later and this is what we call um, a vertex removal operation Okay, we'll see also, we, we, we will stay on this later. And here I also want to recall one comment that I like a lot due to Sang Sang C is that, so he writes in one of his papers, he writes that basically there are not many practical methods uh, to really detect algebras of finite finite dimension. So, and this is in a sense uh, true because it's very hard to compute this and, and, and it's very difficult also with these techniques to get say new examples. And um, yeah, and this is somehow the, the, the motivating qu uh, question for us. So I should recall right, that lambda, I said that it's a finite dimensional algebra over a field. So this means that uh, I will work with a, an admissible quotient of a path algebra. So KQ modulo I, right? And the, and the question is, the basic question is, I would, we would like to understand how the vertices and the arrows of an algebra contribute to the finite dimension. So this is the basic question. So I would like say, to say to remove, to make a, a kind of a surgery to, to throw out things that they don't play any role with respect to the finite dimension. So this is the key idea. And based on this idea, we introduced two operations that we will discuss in this talk. And the point is that at least in terms of, of, of size, right, if you throw out some things, uh, the, the finiteness of the finite dimension is, is reduced to at least a simpler algebra, at least in terms of size, right? Sometimes it's not simpler, but at least it, it's simpler in terms of size. And now uh, following this question, so we ask the same thing for several other homological invariants that are, for instance, uh, detect when the algebra is Gornstein or uh, decide if the, your algebra is singular equivalent with a smaller uh, subalgebra and also detect the, the fine generation condition for host, for host homology. So in the same spirit, we are going to also discuss these three uh, invariants. Okay. Uh, if I speak too, too fast, please tell me. Uh, okay, so I continue. So, so this is our aim. Our aim is to understand somehow how the vertices and arrows contribute to the finitist dimension for Gornsteiners, singularity categories, and the FG condition. Okay, so let's go, let's start with the vertex removal. So lambda is again a, 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 a quotient of path algebra and take E to be a sum of vertices. Now, if you pass to E lambda E, then this algebra correspond to the vertices in E lambda E correspond to the ones which occur in E, and therefore the vertices one minus E, they are removed, okay? 
And the, the, the passing, the transition from lambda to lambda A is what we call a vertex remove. Now, since I want to compare the fine dimension dimension, Gorenstein's, and all these homological invariants, I should be able uh, to know very well how the module categories of this algebra are related. And, this, and, in, and in this case, lambda and, and D lambda E is, they are related with this uh, nice diagram, which is called the recoilment of module categories. Right? So we saw also before a recoilment of boundary of categories. So now this is a recoilment of module categories. So here we have mod lambda, okay, uh, find the rate modules over lambda, uh, the module category of lambda e, and on the left-hand side, you have the quotient algebra lambda modulo the ideal generated by e. And you see that you have on the right-hand side, three functors, lambda e, ah, actually here there's no, uh, yeah. And three functors on the left-hand side. And the definition is the same. So, so, so let's see in the next slide, the, the abstract definition for recoilments of uh, abelian categories. So uh, you have three abelian categories, A, B, and C. And this is called a recoilment if L, E is an adjoint pair, E, R is an adjoint pair, Q, I is an adjoint pair, I, P is an adjoint pair, I, L, and R is fully faithful, and the image of I is exactly the kernel of E. Okay? So, and this is exactly the same definition also for bound derived categories as the first, I asked in the, in the first slide, okay? And as I said, it's very easy to think recall elements going at least for the level of abelian categories going, going from the right to the left, because it's enough here to consider that you have an adjoint triple LER where L or R is fully faithful and you just take the kernel because this is exactly what A is, and then you, you get for free this adjunction here, okay? And I want to introduce also one more uh, very key uh, notion is the notion of event, an eventually homological isomorphism. So uh, a functor between a, uh, abelian categories is called an, uh, an, an eventually homological isomorphism. If you can find a positive iterated C, and the group isomorphism for all n bigger than t and for all objects in B. And for the minimal such t, uh, it is called a t eventually homological isomorphism. Okay? So an eventually homological isomorphism is, it's, it's uh, you want to relate the x groups, right? But it will be eventually, so after some degree, all higher x will be the same. Okay, and this is this notion turns out, ter, turns out to be really crucial in order to compare all of these invariants. We will see. So the, the first problem is to understand uh, in a recoilment of module categories. So in this vertex removal, when did this functor E is an eventual homological isomorphism. So when so this is an exact functor, it gives us a homomorphism between the the extension groups. Okay, and we want to know when um, it's an eventual homological isomorphism. I, I write this as an example, this is the characterization. So this is an eventual homological isomorphism, and it means that you can find the T as this, these groups are isomorphic after for all objects, for all X and Y, for all lambda modules X and Y, and for all uh, I bigger than T, if and only if. So what is in number three? So if the inject dimension, this is lambda modulo E, modulo the radical, and what, it, what this means, right? This means that you, you, let's go back to the diagram. So this means that, that you take all symbols on the left-hand side, you see them as lambda modules, and you ask to have finite inject dimension, okay? So this is what this condition says. And then you ask the projector, the projector dimension of E lambda as a left E lambda E module to be finite, okay? And what, and what this condition says, this, this function in general, you don't know, it will not preserve say projectors, right? There's no reason for this to happen. But if you take a projective here, you want to be sent to a module of finite project dimension, okay? So the, so the two conditions for this functor to be an eventually homological isomorphism 
So to give you an isomorphism between the X in higher degrees is that all simples that they live here, and what means they live here, they are, they are simples in mod lambda that they are killed, they are annihilated by E. Okay, so if all simples here, they have finite inject dimension here as lambda modules, and if any projective, if, and if the functor E sends projectives to modules of finite project dimension, then this functor is an eventually homological isomorphism. So in the case of recall elements of module categories, we know, we know exactly uh, when, when the quotient functor in the recall element, when this functor is an eventually homological isomorphism. Okay, and we also have the, the, the condition number four, which again says that the simples which are annihilated by E uh, as lambda module, they have finite project dimension, and the project dimension of lambda E as a right E lambda E module is fine. Okay. So, as I said, for recall elements of module categories, right? I start with an algebra with an idempotent. Maybe I went too fast. And this means that I get immediately this diagram. Okay. And I'm able to characterize when this functor is uh, an eventually homological isomorphism. Okay. And why, and why this is good for? Okay. I have this characterization and why this is good for. So, the first result is that. Again, you start with an algebra and an idempotent, and suppose I have the diagram here again, okay, just to see it. And suppose that, that you have the condition that this is an eventual homology isomorphism. Then the finite dimension of E lambda E is bound by the maximum of an, the finite dimension of lambda and this T, because you, you see this is the T eventual homology isomorphism. And vice versa, the finite dimension of lambda is less or equal of the maximum of the finite dimension of E lambda E and T. And of course, this implies that the finite dimension of lambda is finite if and only if the finite dimension of E lambda is finite. Okay, so eventually homological isomorphism is a very nice situation in order to compare the finite dimension between lambda and E lambda. And of course, we should keep in mind that somehow the left hand side of the diagram plays a role, right? You don't see it in the statement, but it's somehow part of the assumption because. In order to be eventually homological isomorphism, you, you will have uh, these conditions for the simples that, are in, that they are annihilated by E. Okay, so, th so this, is, this is joint work as you see with Ed Green and Oil Solbert. Um, and let's continue. So now the, the next thing that I want to discuss now is, um, is the following result. And as you see, the title on this slide is Remove Simples of Finite Inject Dimension. So, so we, we can show that, right, that given an algebra with an idempotent, then the finite dimension of lambda is always bounded by the finite dimension of e lambda e plus the supremum of all of the, of the inject dimension of all simples that they are annihilated by e. Okay, and this is very interesting because this result shows that somehow the your simple modules, right? I mean, how you can apply this result? You give me an algebra, right? And I, I and I want to find the simple module that has finite inject dimension, and then I take the corresponding vertex and I apply this result. Okay, so this gives gives us a, a very concrete say and a very practical method to if you give me an algebra to try to at least to do something in order to compute the finite dimension and go to a smaller part, okay? So we have this general upper bound. And let me here um, give an idea of the proof. The proof is very interesting because this, this assumption, I mean, to know that the, uh, the supremum of the inject dimension of this simple is finite, this tells you that for any lambda module, after this degree t, the projectives that you will find are coming from the left, from the right hand side of the of the recall element. And this is why I have this L here. So let sorry for yeah, you see. So in this project resolution, after this degree, all the projectives are coming from from mod lambda. A. So this guy is a left adjoint, so it deserves projectives, right? And with this having this, we know that after this step, 
the projectives are of this form. But now this is very useful. Why? I mean, take now X to be, I mean, you want to find the bounds for defining this dimension, right? Take a, a lambda module of find the dimension, right? You have such a resolution and apply the factor E. So if you apply the factor E, uh, going first with L and then going back with C is the identity. So if you, if you first apply L and then E, it will give you identity here because this guy is fully faithful. And then uh, omega t is the kernel here, you will get to this exact sequence, okay? And this is a finite projected resolution of, of this guy. So then what you have done, I mean, this means that, I mean, you started with a, with a finite projected resolution of x, and this means that the projected dimension of x is less or equal. So this lives in E lambda e, of the finite dimension of E lambda e plus this t, and then you are done, okay? So this is a, a very nice idea that somehow with respect to the finite dimension conjecture, the simplest of finding the dimension doesn't play any role. We can just remove them immediately, okay? And then we go to the smaller part and we hope to compute the fantastic here, okay? Uh, okay. Uh, please, if there's any questions, just uh, feel free to interrupt me, okay? Uh, okay. Um, okay, so this is somehow the, so we saw what we can do with an eventual homological isomorphism with respect to the finite dimension. And now we saw a general upper bound, um, which tells you basically that you can just forget the simplest of finite index dimension, okay? Okay, so let, let's continue. Now, let's go back to the other homological um, uh, invariants that we are interested in. So recall that an algebra is Gornstein if uh, the inject dimension has a left and right lambda module is finite, okay? And together with, with Oivit and Oystein's Skalce Terhagen, we have shown that, again, if you have an eventual homological isomorphism, so I work Right, the setup is the same. Lambda is an algebra with an idempotent element, and I know that the functor E is an eventual homological isomorphism. Okay, then lambda is Gornstein if and only if E lambda is Gornstein. Okay, so I can also detect Gornsteiners if I have eventually homological isomorphism. And now, what about the singularity categories in this setup? So lambda is an algebra. Uh, is an idempotent again, and recall the singularity category due to Buchweiz and Orloff, right? Is this Verdier quotient, DB mod lambda, mo mod the uh, bound complex of finite generated projectives. And here we, we saw that this functor E induces what we call singular equivalence, which means a triangle equivalence between these two uh, singularity categories. If and only if all, uh, all modules on the left hand side as lambda modules, they have final project dimension, and, and lambda um, as a left E lambda E module has final project dimension. And this is if and only if. Okay, so let me show once more the diagram. So we have this diagram, right? I start with an algebra and an idempotent. And the question is when the singularity categories of lambda and the are, and the lambda e are the same, okay? And as you can imagine, the problem is that you're going to get a, a triangle factor between the quotients. So you need, you need say, natural conditions to, get, to send KB prods to KB prods. And this is exactly what's happening because you send lambda to a, to a lambda e prod, a module that has fine project dimension, okay? So the, and the other condition says that everything from, from the left-hand side as a lambda module has finite project dimension. Okay. And then with these two conditions, we know that the factor E induces a triangle equivalent between the singularity categories. So here a small comment, you see that somehow this part one here is not the equivalent conditions that I gave for the eventual homological isomorphism, right? It appeared this one, but 
together with this, appeared the inject dimension of everything coming from the left. Okay, so with so this is not uh, so there's an asymmetry here in these results that this is not exactly the condition that appeared. Sorry for going back here. You see, I need this basically, and I need this. So this here. The project dimension of field lambda is fine. Okay. Yeah. So for so for an algebra lambda with an idempotent, so this arrow removal process, which basically means to work in a recoilment situation, we have all these nice uh, results where we know how to compare at least uh, to do something for the finite dimension, right? To compare uh, Gorenstein's and to compare also the singularity categories. So for the arrow removal, now I, I, I will not discuss the FG condition. Uh, we'll see this uh, for the arrow for the arrow removal. Sorry, I said arrow removal, but I mean uh, here uh, vertex removal. Yes, what? Sorry, yeah, vertex removal. Okay. Um, okay. So, any question? Uh, okay. Um, yeah. And now, so let's go to the second part, and now I'm going to discuss the arrow removal. Okay, so what is the idea now? So we work again with an, with an algebra and I take an arrow, right? That does not belong to a, to a minimal generative set of, of the idea line. Okay, so imagine that, that, that you have a quiver, you have several relations and you pick an arrow that is not part of the relations and you form the question, the quotient gamma. Okay, so this is what we call our removal algebra. So the first thing that, that, that we proved for this maybe strange quotient with Ed Green and Oil Solver is that if you want to remove an arrow which is not in a set of a minimal generators or in the ideal, in the admissible ideal, then this is happening if and only if lambda is isomorphic to this trivial extension where gamma is this subalgebra and P is this gamma gamma by module with this home vanishing condition. Okay, so, so, so you can do this, right? And we know exactly what's the algebra th that, that we get. So lambda is exactly this. Now, the, the point is that, right? I have a, this very nice uh, say characterization and I, and I have a projective, and I have a very nice bimodule. And this is important for several reasons that we'll see later. So the, the point is that I, I, I want, again, everything as before for the fantastic Gorenstein's Etc. So it's very important to understand how the module categories of these algebras are related. And this is not anymore a recoilment, right? This is a trivial extension ring. And for those who know the, the old work of, of, of uh, Fossum, Griffith, Wrighton, the module category is what, they, they, what is named by them a uh, trivial extension of abelian categories. Okay? But we will see something different that in my in, in our opinion is some it's more clear for what we want to do okay so once more so removing an arrow right that is not part is not uh, in the does not belong in a set of minimal generators of i means exactly that lambda is of this form okay trivial extension of gamma that we call the arrow removal with this uh, by module okay and I will also make a comment why this condition is good for how we will see this later. Okay. And for the narrow removal, things go very well with, the, with respect to find this dimension. So take, uh, so we have an algebra again and pick an arrow that is not, does not occur in a set of minimal generators. Okay. And take as before, the, the arrow removal, okay? Then we know that the fantasy dimension of lambda is finite if and only if the fantasy dimension of gamma is fine. And this is again a very uh, nice and uh, really practical uh, result because you give me an algebra and I will immediately look uh, in an arrow just from the, from the quiver that does not belong to any relation and I will just remove it. 
and I know exactly what the rest means with respect to the algebra, right? I, I, I have this nice trivial extension. And then we get this if and only if with respect to the finite dimension. Okay. And now, if I want to summarize what we have discussed so far with respect to the finite dimension, here comes this definition that we gave with Ed and uh, Ovid. So we call an algebra reduced if it's an algebra that you cannot make any triangular, triangular reduction, right? If you cannot apply fossil brief right and results, so it's not of triangular form. All arrows are in some relation in a minimal set of relations, right? So you, don't, you cannot find an arrow that is not part of a relation. And all simple modules have infinite in Z dimension because if they have finite, I can, I can remove them. And project dimension, at least two, because from Fuller and Saurin, we know that we can remove symbols of project dimension one, okay? So if you are in this, and I call, and this is, we call this a reduced class of algebras, because somehow if you believe the finite dimension conjecture, you should go here and, and, and prove it for, for this class of algebra. But on the other hand, if you don't believe the finite dimension conjecture and you look for a counter example, you should again go to this class of algebra. <laughs> okay, so somehow now with these two techniques that I uh, that I show you, and I will explain now more the R removal. It's exactly that we are able to remove this part of the quiver that they don't play any role with respect to the finite dimension. Okay, and what are these? Are the vertices where the corresponding symbols have finite exact dimension? Are the vertices where the corresponding symbols have project dimension one, and we can remove all arrows that they are not part of any relation, okay? And of course, you don't want also the triangular case because then you, you know the, the reduction, okay? Yeah, so what's here, one, one, one comment here is that it's very interesting that somehow uh, we don't have this reduction. I mean, we don't know, we don't know how, what to do if we have a, a simple of project dimension two, say. This is very annoying, right? We have been working on that, but uh, there is no, not really so much progress. Okay, so let's continue. So what I want now, I want to focus on the hour uh, removal and see somehow the categorical background, what is behind this, uh, what is behind this operation. Okay. And here comes a construction, which is due to Belianis. So a cleft extension of an abelian category B is an abelian category A together with these functors in this diagram. And we denote this as B, A, E, L, I, such that this functor E is faithful and exact. You have an adjunction LE, and you ask that this composition is the identity, okay? So it's a very nice and clear definition that, that, this, that basically this generalizes uh, the construction of fossil grid writing for trivial extension of abelian categories. Okay, so you see a cleft accession, what is this again? It's an abelian category B, sorry, a cleft accession of an abelian category B is an abelian category A together with this data. So you have an adjunction here, E is faithful exact. Okay, okay, and this composition gives you the identity. Now, what is that, how can we get such as a splitting for abelian categories or for model categories? The classical, I mean, the basic example is, for, is this. So you have two rings and two ring homomorphisms that their composition gives the identity over gamma. And then mod gamma, then mod lambda, sorry, will be here in the middle and it's a cleft accession of mod gamma, okay? <clears throat> so if you have these two ring morphisms, you will be able to get the adjunction here and the adjunction here. And because of this composition with the identity, you can show that this composition is there then, okay? Now, some, some, some more properties, okay? So the definition I think is very clear, right? Uh, a cleft access of an abelian category B again, it's an abelian category A together with these three functors. And we only ask that E is faithful exact. 
you have the adjunction LE, so L, L is left adjoint, and you want this composition to give you the identity on B. No, nothing more. Okay, and you have several other properties, properties from this definition. So first of all, this functor E is essentially subjective, is what we call dense on objects. Okay. This functor I is fully faithful and exact. The left adjoint is faithful. And if you have, if you work with enough projectives, as we work with as we have in model categories, and the functor will preserve projectives. And you can also get an, an, a functor here, such that also this is an adjunct an adjoint pair. And what is also very interesting is that component, if you compose back from lambda and then to Q, you will get also the identity on B. So if you try to think all the adjoints that, that, that we get from a ring morphism, you will see that this is the case. Okay, so we have again very nice properties, right? But it's not it's not like the column and situation, it's very different, right? Again, so and the basic point is here. So you have a faithful and exact factor, right? And this and this composition. And this is enough, very abstract, to construct also another adjoint here. And so everything, this is a sense of subjective, this is fully faithful and exact, and this is in general faithful, okay? Okay, so now the, the crucial idea of this construction, and this is what's really behind this arrow removal, is that we have very uh, nice end of functors. So, Starting with the starting with the faithful, I mean, here you have an adjunction and D is faithful, right? And this means immediately it's equivalent basically that the co-unit is is an epimorphism. So you have here a kernel and this is uh, an endofunctor from A to an A, and precomposing also with C and then with I or something, you get two more functors. And what we need, what's really important in this, if you want to develop say some homological algebra. In this setup, is 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 a very necessary to have nil potency. So, and what you can show is that if f is nil potent, f is nil potent if and only if g is nil potent. And this is one key property of the other removal is that f square is zero. Okay. Okay. So we have uh, the data of cleft accession, and now we learn that we have also this end of functors. So. Let's now think very abstract to see that you can really do things if you have a control on the on this end of functor G. So, right. So here is a diagram, and I would like to know, say, cases where this E gives me isomorphism between the X in, high, in some higher degrees. Okay, to be an eventual homological isomorphism. Okay, and. If you have some very good say setup, so we ask L to be exact and the factor E to preserve projectives. And what's crucial is this that the supremum of the projective dimension of, of all these objects is bounded by some integer. Then this factor is n plus one eventually homological isomorphism. And then and then again, the idea of the proof is really coming from all this data that we have, because if you just take the sort of exact sequence that we have for any object. And just apply blank alpha, you will see that after some degree, right, this term in the long exact x sequence will vanish, right, and then you will get isomorphism between the x lambda e c comma a to x c comma a, and then you get from this commutativity what you want. So putting assumptions on the end of factor, some nice homological assumptions gives you really properties, really crucial properties for the factors. That, that you want to work. Okay, so in a sense, if you if you are more familiar with three elements, so we were working with lambda and d lambda e, but we had to put assumptions on the left hand side, right? Here, we're going to make this comparison, say between a and b, but we're going to put assumptions, nice homological assumptions for the end of functors that th this data has. Okay. Now, so let's now, uh, so what is now the, the goal? I want to explain that somehow the arrow removal operation induces a cleft accession with very nice homological properties. 
Okay, so here is the definition again of an error removal, and just notice that uh, you can think the error removal not for one arrow. You can see, uh, you can uh, remove multiple arrows that they are not part of the relation. Okay, and then form again the quotient, the arrow removal. Okay, and as the as in the example that, that I that I mentioned before, okay, we, we have a natural inclusion from gamma to lambda such that the composition is identical. Okay, so gamma is this quotient. I mean, for simplicity, you can think that you have one arrow, right? And there is also a natural inclusion which gives this splitting in the diagram. Okay. Okay. Now the, the crucial say uh, slide is the following, where with again with Ed Green and Oivit we analyze completely what are the properties of the arrow removal. Okay, lambda is the algebra. Okay, L lambda is the algebra that I start, and gamma is lambda modulo say uh, one arrow that is not part of a, of a relation. Okay, and then we have this data, this diagram here. So you have, you have an adjoint triple here given by home tensor adjunction, and you have some endo functors. And what are the properties now? This, what are the homological properties? So we have, of course, as, as, as in the definition that this is faithful exact, we have the adjunctions, right? We have that this composition gives identity to, to mod gamma. Now, what's very interesting is that L and R are exact. So this L is a, left, is a tensor product, product is in general right, right at exact, but in this case is, is left exact. It's also left, left exact. And moreover, R is also an exact one. And therefore, E preserves projectives. And what is also very crucial for the computations that are hidden here is that if you take any object, any, any, any module over gamma and you apply F, it will give you a project. If you take any lambda module and you apply G, it will give you a project. Right? These are, are really very crucial properties that comes exactly from the arrow removal. And moreover, as I said, this functor F is important. F squared is zero. Okay. So, so what I, I want to emphasize is that we have a very nice, very nice exact functors on the right hand side. So as you can imagine, I can transfer and do a lot of things. And the, the image of the end of functors sends everything to projectives. Okay. Could you, could you remind me please where these end of functors F and G come from? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so, so starting from this data, Sibylle, right? So the first thing is that you have this, the co unit is an epimorphism because I have an FS like the functor, and then I take the kernel. And then I can create these two more, right? And this is somehow the crucial part that I need to have nice homological properties to do everything that I want later. Okay? Okay, thanks. And then with, and now with the arrow removal, this is really what's happening. So everything in the, in the functor F goes to projective and again, G of something is always projective. Okay, so let me, let me just very briefly, maybe the slide doesn't look so nice, but let, let me just explain at least why this is the case. So you have this, uh, gamma is the quotient. So you have this uh, split exact sequence. So you, you get this, the, the composition here. And you can really show that this is nothing more than this gamma gamma by module, right? And we want the one side, and this is a fun generate as a K module. And therefore everything uh, right, is projected. And therefore all this, Lambda, lambda as a left gamma module is projected. So there is, right? And this gives us the reason why the left adjoint is projected. So it appears inside here, right? From this splitting, this ideal is nothing more than this tensor product. Okay? And moreover, why this function, for instance, is nil potent? If you want to compute F, this functor, to any object, you will see that, so we have the assumption, right? What is the assumption? 
that this home, home lambda, e i lambda f j lambda is zero, but but this isomorphic with this, and this, and this being zero means that this is zero because of the inclusion that, that we have from the splitting. And then if you just try to compute f square, you will see in this form in this computation that we are going to do that inside this will appear and will send everything to zero, right? So these are some very maybe now it's yeah it's not so pleasant to see them in a presentation, but if you take uh, if you try it by yourself or if you use the paper, it's just really uh, not not difficult at all to get this very nice homological property by the by the error mode. Okay. And so he so here here is our, our data again, right? This is the so the, the arrow removal, right? I mean you can think that we remove one arrow that's not part of any relation or the arrows that we have. And then we can show that this factor here is a, a, a one homological homo, homological isomorphism. So what does it mean that here in this diagram? the x after degree two are the same for any x and y for any lambda module x and y so by just removing an arrow you create you create this very nice trivial extension and going from mod lambda to mod gamma gives you very nice very strong relation between, between the x groups okay and and why this is true this is true basically because we have this property because everything is projected and, and as you saw as, as we saw before this was the crucial thing for getting this eventual homological isomorphism and for the arrow removal we have this for free okay this, this is the point we have all these properties to get the eventual homological isomorphism and now if we have the eventual homological isomorphism okay yeah let, let's see so the main final result, which is joint work with Karen Erdman and Ovid again. So, so for 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 an algebra, right, which is KQ modulo i, um, we proved that for the arrow removal, that lambda is Gornstein, if and only if gamma is Gornstein, the functor e always gives me a, a, an equivalence between the singular categories, always. And lambda satisfies FG, even only if gamma satisfies FG. Okay, so I haven't defined what's FG. I will just recall it in the next slide. So I mean the 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 first one follows immediately from the corollary before because I saw you in the in the beginning of the talk that whenever you have an eventual homological isomorphism, Gorenstein is preserved. Okay, so knowing that this is Eventual homological isomorphs, we are done with this. Now, the second, uh, the second thing that we, we can compare the singularity categories is again, it's not, it's not difficult because we have very nice properties between the functors, right? These guys present projectives, and it's also crucial to prove the equivalence that we have also this exact sequence and everything is projected. Okay. So we have really the, the right data to, to get this. Very nice, very nice work. Okay, so arrow removal. So we start with an algebra, we go to the arrow removal. So we have just throw out an arrow that is not part of any relation. And then we know that Gorenstein is preserved. And secondly, we know that the singularity categories of lambda and gamma are the same. Okay, let's now see in the last minutes the FG. Ah, yeah, and I forget I have it's I think it's time for an example <laughs> uh, before I move to FDFG. So take this nice quiver here. And here are the relations. And I claim that the algebras lambda one and lambda n are related by an arrow removal because as you will see, A2 is not here, A3 is not here, A n is not here, right? And all these algebras, lambda one, lambda two, lambda n, are all singular equivalent. Right, and what is very interesting that if you think if you if you just keep lambda one is of finite type, if you have lambda two, you have these two parallel is is of is same type, and lambda n is of y. So this is I didn't know this before that somehow you you can have algebras 
of different representation type that are singularly equivalent, that the, the singularity categories are equivalent. Okay, and you get this very nice because you just remove all these arrows. Okay, so this is an example. And now let me pass to the FG condition. Uh, so the, this goes back to, to Snassel and Sorbeck. So they have extended as I'm writing the theory of support varieties from group algebras to find dimensional algebras. And their idea was to replace right, group cohomology with host cohomology. And somehow in order to have this or support varieties develop uh, things that they could support varieties, they introduce the FG condition. And the condition says that you ask for the host of the ring in Ethereum, and you ask this, this mod here, which is a module over the host, host homology, to be found in the Okay? So this is the FG condition. So once more, the host homology ring, we want to be in Ethereum, and the X lambda modulo radical, lambda modulo radical to be a fan generated module over the um, host homology. And now, right, we also proved for an arrow removal that if you want to check FG for lambda, just check FG for gamma, right? If you want to check the finite generation condition for, for, for host homology uh, for lambda, just check for gamma. And yeah, this, this proof needs quite some work. It's not so obvious by, by the homological properties that we have. You need to do some more things, but I just want to emphasize the following fact that somehow we still get some nice properties when we pass uh, to the enveloping algebra. So for instance, we, we also get some, if you just take the, the algebra homomorphism, then you get a, a cleft extension between the enveloping algebra of gamma and lambda. And moreover, you get a nice cleft extension here where you get, where you get again, nice homological property between now the enveloping algebra. So for instance, this factor is again exact or the, 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 the factor F, the end of factor F that we have here is again nilpotent. So part of the proof is to analyze and understand that if you have this cleft extension that the area removal gave us, you would like to understand as a first step properties by just going to the enveloping algorithm. And most of these properties that we were hoping to for R3, okay. Um, yeah, and let me finish with, an, with a final example. Um, take this quiver and the relation, the, the relation are A square, A, B minus B, A, and B square and A, C. So take KQ modulo I, and this is work in progress, but we can show that going from lambda to gamma is again a cleft extension. This is this joint work with Karin and Oivit. And as you see, now C is part of a special relation, but we can also remove such arrows now. But what is interesting now with this example is that we know there's a paper by Fake Su that this algebra, maybe it was one of the first known examples, but does not satisfy the FG condition. But if you kill this arrow, then gamma satisfies that condition because symmetric it's a symmetric radical cube zero algebra. And we know this by Edman and Sol. So this hour removal business is very crucial that the arrow, at least with respect to FG, is very crucial that the arrow is not part of any relation to get to get this this result. Okay. Yeah. So I think I'm very good here. Thank you very very much for your attention. And I'm very sorry if I'm talking very fast. <laughs> <laughs>